This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 295 of the program. Today is Friday, June 18th, and before we get started, I want to take some time, as we usually do, to thank all of the folks who make this show possible. All of our newest supporters on either Patreon, PayPal, YouTube, or Twitch. And that includes Becca Link, Coulter Smith, Jessica Vatt, Mountain Scotsman, Scott Collier, and Tom Chavez. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you would also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com forward slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. So this week, we've got quite the interested epi- uh, interesting episode, not really any consistent themes, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but nonetheless, I hope you enjoy what we uh, have in store. This week, Mitch McConnell is already plotting to steal another Supreme Court seat if he can. Marco Rubio proposes an absurd student debt relief plan. Marjorie Greene makes her first public apology after getting a history lesson in how bad the Holocaust is. Apparently, a grown woman didn't know about this already. Reality when it gets released from prison. Israel breaks their ceasefire. Ted Cruz virtue signals and progressives put their foot down once and for all and stand up to Joe Biden when it comes to infrastructure. That's what we've got on the agenda for today's program. I hope you enjoy what we have in store. Let's get right to it. So after months of this back and forth between the Biden administration and Republicans and conservative Democrats, when it comes to infrastructure, they've made effectively no progress. All of these negotiations have amounted to nothing. So I think that it's obvious by now most Democrats are beginning to see that the conclusion is stop doing this political theater that is bipartisanship. Republicans aren't actually good faith actors. They're not serious about infrastructure. They don't want to work with you. They just want to obstruct everything. But in the spirit of good faith negotiations that aren't actually that good for people and the planet, a top Biden administration official hinted at them possibly watering down their already meager infrastructure package to appease Republicans. And one of the main things on the uh, on the cutting block are the most important elements of the infrastructure proposal addressing climate change, investing in clean, green, renewable technology. No, this is not a Green New Deal. This is not even a Green New Deal light. But is it a step forward in the right direction? Yes, it is. And one of the best things about this, Biden's administration signaled, we're willing to get rid of that. So this is bad. But thankfully, progressives collectively coalesced around a single unified message. If you do this, You're not going to have our support. And to see them all come together and unequivocally denounce the prospect of gutting climate change from infrastructure is really, really encouraging to see. So for more on this, we go to Common Dreams, where Jake Johnson explains progressive members of Congress on Wednesday signaled they would be willing to withhold their votes from any infrastructure package that skimps on climate action after one of President Joe Biden's top advisors suggested that key green energy proposals could be excluded from an eventual bill. An infrastructure package that goes light on climate and clean energy should not count on every Democratic vote. Senator Martin Heinrich, a Green New Deal supporter, tweeted in response to National Climate Climate advisor Gina McCarthy suggests on Tuesday that climate policies proposed in Biden's original American jobs plan, such as a clean electricity standard, could be left on the cutting room floor as the president seeks a compromise deal with a bipartisan group of senators. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the lead House sponsor of the Green New Deal resolution, echoed Heinrich declaring, Mitch McConnell and the Koch brothers are not worth setting the planet on fire for. President Joe Biden and Senate Democrats should take a step back and ask themselves if playing patty cake with GOP senators is really worth the dismantling of people's voting rights, setting the planet on fire, allowing massive corporations and the wealthy to not pay their fair share of taxes, etc., said Ocasio-Cortez, who has backed progressive calls for $10 trillion in infrastructure spending and climate spending over the next decade. So now this is exactly what progressives need to be doing. Credit where it's due. I've been critical of them in the past for not being unified, for not standing up to Republicans and conservative Democrats. But right now they're finally doing exactly what I had hoped they'd start to do. 
throw their weight around, make some demands. And this is only the most reasonable demand ever. We have, what, less than 10 years now, according to the IPCC, to stop catastrophic levels of climate change. And what's being proposed here in this infrastructure plan, this isn't even sufficient. To even say that it's the bare minimum is a bit of a stretch, but if you're going to tackle infrastructure without addressing climate change, without investing in clean and green renewable technology somewhat, it's just, what's the point? It's useless. So thankfully, progressives are standing firm and they're saying, no climate, no deal. And perhaps more importantly, members of the Senate who basically are doing everything they can seemingly to appease individuals like Joe Manchin, Kirsten Cinema, even they have seemingly had enough. So Ed Markey and Jeff Merkley, my senator, they both held a joint press conference and they echo the sentiments expressed by Ocasio-Cortez and Heinrich. And what they said here, like the way that they went after the GOP and called on Biden to not continue this game of bipartisanship which is just nothing more than political theater at this point like everything that they said in short it was perfect take a look no climate no deal we need to move forward with 50 democratic votes now that the republicans have shown us they are not serious about creating clean energy jobs jump-starting a clean energy revolution or adding the standards and investments we need to attack this crisis we cannot let Republican calls for bipartisanship deny the American people the climate action that they have been demanding. Last fall, Americans in every corner of this country voted for climate action. And right now, they are holding these IOUs. The GOP, or the gas and oil party, would love nothing better than for these voters to be disillusioned by gridlock and inaction. But we know better. And we're going to do better because climate action is both good policy and it is good politics. President Biden's American Rescue Plan was immensely popular with Americans of both parties uh, and with independents. And we got it done along party lines because the Republicans refused to get serious about the challenges facing us. The same principles of victory uh, from earlier this year must guide us in this new endeavor. Climate action has bipartisan support outside of Congress. 76% of Americans believe that climate change is either a critical or important threat, including 74% of independents and 58% of Republicans. Fiercer storms, more drought, greater fires. We're talking about an impact on the foundations of rural America and that is on our forests, on our fishing, and on our farming. So this is not partisan. This is not urban-rural. This is all of America responding to a grave threat, a threat that is a planetary threat. And it needs to be America acting because we have the problem here in America, but America acting because we need America's leadership in the world. The air is a planetary commons. We have to work in partnership with the world. And if we don't set the example and we don't drive the conversation, no one else will. So here we are at this critical question. Will we take bold action on climate infrastructure? Will we invest hugely in renewable energy into the grid? Will we upgrade that grid? Will we invest extensively in energy efficiency? And will we convert the end uses that are a bit dependent upon fossil fuels into a system based on that renewable electricity? That's from buses to cars to the heating systems of buildings to electric pickups and tractors which are being prepared to create that economy across this country. That investment in these areas will have a profound impact on our renewable energy economy here in the United States and create millions of good paying jobs. So this is about saving the planet, but it's also about a profound impact on working America. Again, this is not partisan. And so therefore, when we talk about infrastructure, when the ship sails on infrastructure, 
energy investments cannot be left on the docks. If there is no climate, there is no deal. So watching this was really nice to see. This is what I have been wanting Democratic Party officials to do for years now. It's what I've been advocating for on this program. Actually fight back against the GOP. Don't allow them to frame the narrative and set the agenda. Actually make the case. And finally, that's what they did. And what Ed Marquis and Jeff Merkley are saying, as well as uh, progressive lawmakers in the House, is we're no longer going to kowtow to the dem demands of Joe Manchin. It's not going to be about will he support the bill. It's going to be about whether or not we'll support this bill and give up our votes. And we won't if you don't include proposals addressing climate change. And that's really important. That's really, really important. Because to support an infrastructure bill that doesn't contain anything addressing the climate crisis... It's just unreasonable. It's absurd. And the so-called moderate senators, such as Mitt Romney, are saying, well, look, if Joe B Biden wants to address climate change, he could do that in a separate bill. No. Why? So you all can block that as well. When we're talking about addressing climate change, one of the key things is to move away from our dependence on fossil fuels. And that requires changes to our infrastructure. The way that we heat our homes, the way we uh, we do a lot of things in this country. So to even suggest that an infrastructure bill shouldn't have any elements addressing climate change is absurd on its face. And thankfully, this is what Ed, Mer Ed Markey and Jeff Merkley are saying. I almost called him Ed Merkley. Their names are very similar. Uh, having said that, though, uh, I want to get to some of the key things here that are really important that they said. So um, I like them trying to rebrand the party, uh, the GOP, as the gas and oil party. This is good branding because always we hear right-wingers all in unison say the same thing. Oh, well, it's, you know, this Democratic Party, they're communist, they're socialist, they're extreme. They throw out all of these buzzwords that they don't even understand half the time or most of the time, I should say. And Democrats, they never push back. They always say, oh, no, we're not socialists. We're not this. They're always playing defense. But they need to go on offense. This is something that I've been advocating for for quite some time. And by saying that the gas and oil party, that is brilliant. Because as Ed Markey rightfully pointed out, this is a bipartisan issue. It might not have bipartisan support to address climate change in Congress. But Americans, by and large, overwhelmingly want something to be done about climate change. He said climate action has bipartisan support outside of Congress. 76% of Americans believe that climate change is either a critical or important threat, including 74% of independents and 58% of Republicans. This is what I've been saying for years when I say make the case. When you have public opinion on your side, there is no reason to back down because the current political climate isn't conducive to you being successful on a particular issue. And this is what I've been saying about Medicare for All. I don't care that there's not enough votes to pass Medicare for All. When you look at public opinion polls, there is no division. The American people, a majority of them support Medicare for All. And it's because we all have experience dealing with the private insurance industry. We have health insurance and then, uh, you know, we expect to have our doctor visit covered and then we get a bill. It's just we all hate our private insurance companies. So what Democrats need to do, the ones who actually aren't beholden to their corporate donors and who actually care, uh, the progressives, is they have to make the case. They have to make the case and say, we are the ones fighting for the American people. We're the ones arguing for bipartisan legislation supported by Democrats and Republicans, not in Congress, but across the country. And Jeff Merkley chimes in saying fiercer storms, more drought, greater fires. We're talking about an impact on the foundations of rural America. And that's really important because Republicans try to frame themselves as the party who's looking out for farmers and whatnot. But climate change is an issue that affects everyone, not necessarily equally, but it affects rural America, urban America. It's not about ur rural urban. So everything that I'm seeing here in short, like you can sum up this entire video by saying, great job, more of this. I want to see Democrats fight. I want to see them attack Republicans and not just respond to their attacks. Go on the offensive because if you're on the right side of an issue, you have nothing to be afraid of. You should boldly make your case 
and fight for what's right. And this right here is encouraging to see more of this, please. Less cowering in fear to Republicans, less standing down when corporate Democrats speak up, and more of this. This is good. Please continue to do this. Please be unified as a block in Congress, both the House and the Senate, and keep fighting Republicans and your own party, because if you want to be victorious, this is what you have to do. You have to make your case because you can't win if you don't even make your case. This is great. Good job. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I know what to say to make people cheer if they're really dumb and conservative, so I'm going to feed into that. That, folks, is what we call virtue signaling. And Senator Ted Cruz thought that it would prove how serious he is as a person to post that himself to his Twitter page. <laughs> and the worst part about this cringe fest is that he thought that he was being edgy by posting that. He said this didn't used to be controversial. He's so edgy. Are you triggered? Yes, you watching this, are you triggered? I bet you're so mad right now watching him pledge allegiance to the flag. I bet you hate America and watching that, it just makes you so upset. I mean, it's just, <laughs> he's trying to make bootlicking seem like counterculture, but what he's doing here, it's not cool. It's, it's lame, it's cultish, and you look like a stupid person, Ted Cruz. And to think that what you're doing is, like, edgy, that makes it exponentially more cringe than it already is. And look, at least when Donald Trump came into contact with a flag, he hugged the flag. You were, like, super cold and distant, so, like, judging by the way that you and Trump interact with the flag, I have to deduce that Trump is more patriotic than you because you didn't even hug the flag. Four out of ten. You tried. No, but, like, in all seriousness, I don't know what it was about Flag Day, but more so than ever, Republicans tried to prove how weird they are on Flag Day, uh, Newsmax had an even more bizarre segment than what Ted Cruz posted to Twitter, and they went around interviewing people on Flag Day, and it coincided with Trump's birthday, so they basically got people to say happy birthday to Donald Trump. I, I don't even understand how a news organization can justify posting this without being embarrassed. Nonetheless, they did. June 14th, Flag Day the day when the United States adopted the red, white, and blue as our official national flag. And, coincidentally, it's former President Donald Trump's 75th birthday. Our James Klug went out to get birthday greetings. James. What's going on, everyone? James Klug here. Today is President Donald Trump's birthday, and we're going to ask people in Huntington Beach if they have a message for him. Today is Donald Trump's birthday. Do you have a message for him? Uh, happy, happy, happy birthday, and I hope I see him back. Do you have a message for him? Yeah, I wish him a great birthday. I hope he's doing well. I hope with all the this public hate going on, it's not getting to him and uh, he's out there killing it on the golf course. Happy <laughs> birthday, Trump. And I hope he comes back in 2024. Uh, happy birthday, Mr. Trump, and go out and shoot the low 70s today. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. We love the guy. He's love. awesome. Yep. Hawaii loves him. He hugs the flag. That's what I love about him. Today's Donald Trump's birthday. Do you guys have a message for him? Love you, Donald Trump. Oh my gosh, our favorite news show. Hey. Hey. It's Donald Trump's birthday today. Do you have a message for him? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. We happy miss birthday. you. We miss you. Oh, oh my gosh. Happy birthday, Donald. Right happy on. birthday. Uh, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Hope you're doing well. I'm not going to wish you a happy birthday because I think you're a jerk and I think you should be in jail for all the laws that you broke. <laughs> what laws specifically? Of course you would ask me that. For the details? For the details, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have any details. Sorry. Makes sense. If you could get him one gift, what would you get him? Come back. If we could get him one gift, what would it be? A new voting machine. <laughs> a new voting machine? I can't afford to buy him anything, but... Maybe we could print out a photo of him hugging the flag. Roger. You could sign it. Uh, he'll sign the gift to me? <laughs> yeah, I'll take that. Uh, maybe like a filet of fish from McDonald's. You know, I know he likes McDonald's. And the Big Mac, I know he likes that too. It keeps him in that perfect um, health, you know? A good Mickey D's delivery? Oh, yeah, exactly, for sure. Maybe a new haircut. That's iconic, though. It is. It is. It is. Probably another golf club, because I think he needs a new one. What do you get for somebody who has everything? A Twitter account? <laughs> You know what? I think I would get him a Bible. He may already have one, but what better gift can you get someone than the Word of God? 
Congratulations, you've proven successfully how sycophantic you are to Donald Trump. I hope he sees this, bro. I hope he sees how loyal you are. This is embarrassing. And look, as someone who is uh, very outspokenly in favor of, uh, or was outspokenly in favor of Bernie Sanders in 2016 and 2020, like if I posted something like that, I would be embarrassed with myself because you look foolish. Like it, it crosses from, you know, supporting a politician to just like worshiping a politician. But what I want to say is that that lady, I'm so disappointed in the lady who said, oh, well, I'm not going to wish him a happy birthday. Like you couldn't even name one thing, uh, this lady. I'm not going to wish you a happy birthday because I think you're a jerk and I think you should be in jail for all the laws that you broke. <laughs> what laws specifically? Of course you would ask me that. For the details? For the details? I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have any details. Really? You couldn't even name one thing? He was in violation of the emoluments clause for the entirety of his presidency. He violated international laws, committed war crimes. The things that he did in office, he should be in the Hague for the rest of his life. He possibly committed a uh, tax fraud. And you can't even come up with one thing. Come on, God, liberals, you've got to do better. But the reason why I'm showing this to you is because I want you to see here. This is what the right wingers in America are focusing on. While they're, you know, posting videos of themselves saying Pledge of Allegiance to the flag while they're worshiping Donald Trump, while they're focused on, you know, the issues that really matter, like Mr. Potato Head and Cat in the Hat getting canceled by their owners and uh, Blue's Clues doing Pride Parade stuff. What we're doing on the left is actually serious things. We're having real conversations about medical debt and Medicare for all and our broken for-profit healthcare system. We're talking about the student debt crisis. We're talking about anthropogenic climate change and what we need to do about it in order to stop catastrophic levels of climate change from wiping out our entire species. We're talking about actually ending U.S. imperialism, stopping our forever wars, stop the commodification of our democracy before it erodes democracy even further. That's the things that we routinely talk about on the left. Like, find any left-wing YouTuber or Twitch streamer and go through their catalog and you'll see like some junk food content, like us dunking on Dave Rubin for saying something stupid. But by and large, most of our content is focused on substance. But Republicans, they never focus on substance. They're always fixated on some culture war issue. And there's a very specific reason for that. It's deliberate. It's because they don't have any solutions to the problems in this country. Like, it's evident that there's a bevy of issues that need fixing in this country. I don't care where you fall on the political spectrum. You can be a leftist. You can be a centrist. You can be a right winger. You acknowledge that there are issues in this country that need to be addressed, right? I may disagree with the solutions you propose, but nonetheless, you acknowledge that there are issues. Why is it that Republicans never talk about the core issues? Why don't they talk about the serious things? It's because they're not serious people. They're not serious people. You have Republican lawmakers pushing QAnon conspiracy theories, claiming that the election was stolen, fear-mongering about critical race theory as if this is the biggest threat, freaking out about acceptance of LGBTQ plus people, blocking the Equality Act from getting passed because they claim that this will lead to discrimination against religious people. They're not serious. While most of society has moved on and the overwhelming majority of Americans, for example, have accepted marriage equality and gay rights, they're still trying to bring us backwards. It's because these are all distractions. Right-wingers don't actually care about anything. There is no coherent right-wing ideology other than to uphold the status quo. What members of Congress who are Republicans want, and a lot of Democrats do to an extent, to be fair, most Democrats, corporate Democrats, they just want to make sure that their corporate donors get what they want, deregulation and tax cuts, and the way that they get voters to support them, even if they know that economically they're going to be fucked over by this party, is they focus on dumb fucking issues like this. Because unfortunately, it kind of works. Even if a Republican, just a normal Republican, might agree with you and I that Medicare for all is something that we need, they might rank that lower on the issues that they care more about. So they might think, well, you know what? I've heard a lot about transgender issues. 
and it seems as if transgender people are predators because that's what Newsmax and Fox News told me. So I should probably vote Republican, even if they're not going to do anything about the health crisis in America, because at least they're going to take care of this, you know, this predator issue that we have. It's always something to be afraid about. And look, I'm not saying that scare tactics aren't a political tool that's effective and useful. There are things that we need to be worried about, but we should be worried about the real issues, climate change. People dying every single year because they don't have healthcare. But these right-wingers, what are they doing? Virtue signaling about the flag. Members of Congress holding rallies saying, we're not going to wear masks. This is like the Holocaust. They're not serious people. Well, it's happening again. Israel has confirmed that they have bombed Gaza, breaking their ceasefire yet again. Now, this is a developing story. As I record this, the details are still scarce. Having said that, though, here's what I know at the time that I'm filming this. As AJ Plus reports, breaking, Israel confirmed it launched airstrikes on occupied Gaza. The attack comes weeks after Israeli airstrikes in May killed over 250 Palestinians and hours after Israel allowed a far-right nationalist march in occupied East Jerusalem. Now, a lot of folks who don't necessarily follow Israeli politics too closely might be thinking, wait... I thought that Benjamin Netanyahu, who was like the main problem, is out. So they have a new prime minister, so things in theory should get better, right? Well, actually, no. The new prime minister, at best, is as bad as Benjamin Netanyahu, but at worst, is more extreme than Benjamin Netanyahu. A far-right extremist, ethno-nationalist war criminal. Yeah. There's actually a bar lower than that. So as Ariel Gold of Common Dreams explains, after 12 years, Israel finally inaugurated a new prime minister. While being hailed by many as the opportunity for a fresh start, Naftali Bennett is at best a continuation of Netanyahu's policies and at worst, an ideologue whose positions are to the right of Netanyahu's. In 2013, as Middle East peace talks were set to resume after a five-year freeze, Bennett reportedly proclaimed to Israeli National Security Advisor Yaakov Amidror, I've killed lots of Arabs in my life, and there's no problem with that. In 2014, Bennett, who had previously been the director of Yesha Settlements Council, contradicted Netanyahu by asserting that all Jewish Israelis living in the West Bank, even those living in outposts that violate Israeli law, should remain under Israeli sovereignty and called for more settlement construction. This is the time to act, he said. We must continue building in all corners of the land of Israel with determination and without being confused. We are building and we will not stop. In 2016, as Israel's Minister of Education, Bennett called on Israeli Jews to give our lives to annex the West Bank. While this might seem relatively innocuous, it was not. Bennett's remarks invoked Kahanism, a Jewish supremacist ideology based on the views of Rabbi Mir Kahan that calls for violence and terrorism to be used to secure Israel as an ethno-nationalist state. In 1994, Israeli settler and Kahan follower Baruch Goldstein massacred Palestinians in the West Bank Ibrahimi Mosque. In 1988, the Koch party was banned from running for the Israeli Knesset. In 2004, the U.S. State Department labeled Koch a terrorist organization. Sunday, June 13, 2021, right before he was inaugurated to replace Netanyahu as the Prime Minister of Israel, Bennett doubled down on his anti-Palestinian views, proclaiming that his government would strengthen settlements across the whole of the land of Israel. So if you thought that things were going to get better, unfortunately, that's not the case. Again, at best, this is a continuation of the status quo, but things could deteriorate further with this extremist. And really, the only check on his power is he has to hold together this really broad coalition of parties. Otherwise, he's not going to remain in power. So he does kind of have that check on him. But this individual is an extremist. He's not just an ethno-nationalist. But he is deeply theocratic, and he really revealed how theocratic he is in a 2017 interview with Mehdi Hassan that Mehdi shared the other day. And this is honestly, it's astounding that this person is now the prime minister. You're not carving out your own country. Uh, you're withdrawing from occupied territories, which everyone in the world, including Israel's own Supreme Court, regards as occupied territory. That's the problem. You can't carve out stuff that's <laughs> not your own. Mahdi, I, I guess what you need to do is go uh, back and change the Bible. You need to change the narrative of the Bible because it's all there. Is, and I assume is Israel a all Muslims, uh, I th is Christians, Israel a theocracy? and Jews. Is it a religious state? I assume. Why are you quoting the Bible to me? I'm quoting the, the Supreme Christians, Court Muslims, of and your Jews. Country. 
Hold on, the Supreme Court of your let country. Let me finish. Let, let me just put the quote yeah, of the yeah, Supreme Court to you and then you respond. You're finding... Ju the Judea and Samaria areas are held by the state of Israel in belligerent occupation. That is the view of the Supreme Court of your country. Are you saying the Bible trumps your Supreme Court? Is Israel now a theocracy? Let me finish. Um, billions of Muslims and Christians believe in the Bible. I assume, uh, including yourself, I don't know. If you want to uh, say that our land does not belong to us, I, I suggest you go change the Bible first, come back and then show me a new Bible that says that the land of Israel doesn't belong to Jews. Well, I mean, this book with talking snakes and other mythical creatures, you know, three-headed beasts, it says that Israel belongs to us. So, sorry, Palestinians, looks like you all have to leave your homes and uh, go away. It's just, it's shocking. Like, extremist after extremist keeps getting elected. It's not just a trend in Israel. I mean, we see Bolsonaro in Brazil, Trump in the United States, Modi in India. There are extremists all around the world who are emerging. But, you know, for a situation that's as volatile as this, as sensitive as this, you need someone who isn't as much of a provocateur. I mean, I don't know what the right word is to use. Netanyahu should be in prison for the rest of his life. And this is the individual who critiqued Netanyahu because he wasn't extreme enough. The situation is just bad. And we're seeing that things aren't changing already. The ceasefire is broken. So, you know, um, there's going to be more to come on this story. I'm sure. Hopefully this isn't going to be a prolonged bombing campaign. But all I know is that the situation is tragic and just more will continue unless the U.S. government stops defending this stops being complicit in these crimes against humanity. If you regain the majority in 2022 for the Republicans, and there's a very good chance of that happening, I'll come back to the individual races in a second. Would the rule that you applied in 2016 to the Scalia vacancy apply in 2024 to any vacancy that occurred then? Well, I think in the middle of a presidential election, if you have a Senate of the opposite party of the president, you have to go back to the 1880s to find the last time a vacancy was filled. So I think it's highly unlikely. In fact, no, I don't think either party, if it controlled, if it were different from the president, would confirm a Supreme Court nominee in the middle of an election. That, uh, what was different in 2020 was we were of the same party as the Correct. president. Mm -hmm. That was Senate Minority Leader, obviously, Mitch McConnell, stating what should be already apparent to people if you've been paying attention. If Republicans retake control of the Senate in 2022 and there's a Supreme Court vacancy that emerges in 2024, obviously he's not going to fill that seat with someone Joe Biden nominates. He's going to hold that seat open until a Republican assumes power once again, and then he's going to fill the seat. It doesn't matter what the optics are. He doesn't care about how hypocritical it makes him look. All he cares about is power. And he's effective at gaining power. And even though he's disgusting and he's a liar... I wish that Democrats would emulate his strategy at least a little bit if they want to be somewhat effective. But basically, what, what he's telling everyone is that it really doesn't matter what the circumstances are, what the political context is at that given moment. If a Democrat is in the White House and I'm in control of the Senate, they're not going to get a seat. I'll just make up an excuse based on whatever is convenient. And um, that's that. This is what Mitch McConnell has been doing and what he will continue to do so long as he is the leader of the Republican Party. But that was 2024. What about 2023? The same thing still applies. And I think that uh, Mark Joseph Stern of Slade put it best. Republicans will never confirm another Democrat appointed Supreme Court judge. And this is obvious. Like this is obvious to anyone who's been paying attention and anyone who doesn't see this and assume this is the case is naive. Now, when asked about the possibility of a vacancy being filled in 2023 if Republicans control the Senate, Mitch McConnell said, well, we'd have to wait and see what happens. In other words, no. Again, he doesn't care what the year is, if it's an election year or a non-election year. His goal is to pack the Supreme Court with right-wingers. And he's already stolen two seats from Democratic administrations. And do you think he's going to stop now all of a sudden because there's been a lot of backlash. He doesn't care 
it's Mitch McConnell. So even though I think this is all obvious and the question didn't even need to be asked in order for us to learn what the answer would be, what I do think is important about this story is that it's renewed calls for the Supreme Court to be expanded, even if it seems like a long shot. So as Jake Johnson of Common Dreams explains, progressive calls to add seats to the U.S. Supreme Court gained fresh urgency Monday after Republican Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell suggested he would block President Joe Biden from filling a potential high court vacancy if Republicans wrest back control of the upper chamber in next year's midterms. Mitch McConnell is already foreshadowing that he'll steal a third Supreme Court seat if he gets the chance, tweeted Senator Ed Markey, referring to the Kentucky Republicans' obstruction of Garland as as well as the GOP's successful confirmation of Justice Amy Coney Barrett just eight days out from the 2020 presidential election. He's done it before and he'll do it again, Marquis added. We need to expand the Supreme Court. Marquis is the lead Senate sponsor of the Judiciary Act of 2021, bicameral legislation that aims to counter right-wing dominance of the Supreme Court by adding four seats to the body, bringing the total to 13. But Biden has thus far declined to back calls to expand the Supreme Court, opting instead to form a 36-member commission tasked with studying reform ideas, including the addition of seats. So put simply, Biden doesn't support expanding the court. What he's trying to do is placate the folks who are advocating for the court to be expanded. And when inevitably he doesn't do that, he can at least say, well, look, I put some effort into it. We had this commission and um, yeah, he's giving himself plausible deniability. But this commission is not going to lead to the court being expanded. It's just not. And uh, as Demand Justice puts it, we don't have time to wait for a commission of academics to publish a pro-con list. Expand the court now. And that's exactly it. Democrats don't really seem to grasp the implications of this far-right court being in control. They have a 6-3 majority currently. So we're possibly looking at the prospect of affirmative action being ruled unconstitutional. Uh, Roe v. Wade being overturned. This court is going to dismantle what is left of our democracy, and the only way to stop right-wing court packing is to expand the size of the court. There's nothing in the Constitution that says it should only be nine justices. But I know by now I'm preaching to the choir. Most people who watch this already know the importance of expanding the court. The bad news is that even though calls have been renewed to expand the Supreme Court, it's not going to amount to Joe Biden expanding the Supreme Court. He's just... He's not going to do it. He's weak. He won't even stand up to people in his own party, let alone Republicans. So, you know, what's going to happen is the Republican dominance of our judiciary and entire judicial system, you know, and not just the Supreme Court, but the hundreds of justices at the federal level that Trump appointed, they're going to dismantle any progressive reforms that actually do get through. And we will continue to circle the drain as a country. Democracy will continue to be eroded and Republican mega donors will get exactly what they want it's uh depressing and i don't mean to be too doomer but if we don't take drastic action and expand the court this is what's going to happen and also we should abolish the senate as well while we're at it because abolishing the senate will break the stronghold that right-wing states have on our entire democracy but i mean that's a different story for a different day uh what matters right now for purposes of this story is expanding the supreme court because mitch mcconnell just signaled to democrats that he's going to continue to pack the courts with right-wingers and if democrats don't stand up and actually fight this by expanding the supreme court then um what's been happening will continue to happen the country will continue to be destroyed by these psychopaths who don't care about anything. They don't care about civil rights, civil liberties. They don't care about anything but appeasing their right-wing donors. Well, the student loan debt crisis isn't going to go away anytime soon, but thankfully for all of us, one brave Republican senator came up with a new ambitious plan, dare I say too ambitious, to alleviate the student loan debt of possibly dozens of people. Temporarily, but nonetheless, dozens of people. Wow. So uh, here's what that is. The Guardian reports Marco Rubio wants to pause student debt, but only to terrorism survivors. Florida senator introduced a bill to provide a one-year pause for victims to get back on their feet. Now, his office didn't bother to clarify how this legislation will define a terror attack, but nonetheless, I mean, this is incredibly generous. And I don't want to say that he's a hero just yet for proposing this, but... It's kind of heroic if you think about this. And the only question is, 
Who's going to help more people, Marco Rubio with this plan or Kamala Harris with her plan? Now, for those of you who don't remember what she proposed when she was running for president, this was her plan to alleviate student debt. She wanted to establish a student loan debt forgiveness program for Pell Grant recipients who start a business that operates for three years in disadvantaged communities. Folks, I mean, all of these innovative new ideas that are being proposed, they could possibly help dozens of people. Not even a hundred, but I mean, we're talking dozens of people. This is, this is incredible. It's inspiring. Now, of course, I'm being facetious because these plans are dog shit, but it reminds me of um, Nathan for you. And somebody shared this on Twitter, and I wish I could credit them, but I don't remember who said it. But basically, they compared this to a skit that Nathan for you did where he was selling $1 TVs, but the catch was that you had to wear a tuxedo, crawl through a tiny door, and go past a hungry alligator in order to get the TV. I mean, does that not sound kind of like these student loan programs we keep seeing get proposed where the eligibility for debt relief is so small that the amount of people who this is going to impact? I mean, obviously, it's not going to make a dent in the overall student debt crisis. But nonetheless, these folks propose these laughable, almost insultingly bad student debt relief programs. And I guess they want to be commended for it. it it's just it's laughable. It's just laughable. Now, the responses to Marco Rubio's plan, they were great. This person says, congratulations to Marco Rubio for literally doing the least that he could possibly do to address the student loan crisis. Uh, this meme, I think, was perfect. Me, drowning in student loan debt. One year deferral of federal student loans if I survive a terror attack. Yep, and I'm still drowning. <laughs> Folks, this is the state of American politics. We will put your student loans on pause for one year if every day you put on clown makeup and wear a clown wig and you make at least 10 farts a day and you record them and submit proof that you farted 10 times. And all, on top of that, you uh, deliver ice cream to five people of your choice once per week. This is stupid. This is clown shit. But since we're talking about student loans, uh, I think that there's a really important reminder published in Teen Vogue by Braxton Brewington. And he says Biden could cancel student loan debt right now by signing an executive order. And we're not talking about him canceling $10,000 or pausing it for a year. We're talking about wiping it out entirely for 100% of student loan holders. He goes on to explain, when the Department of Education was first given the power to issue student loans, it was also granted the power to compromise, waive, or release any right to collect on them, an authority known as compromise and settlement. Essentially, the Biden administration can suspend the collection of student debt altogether and poof, tens of millions of Americans would be student loan debt free. It'd be like waving a magic wand, except the wand isn't magic. It's a legitimate legal authority vested in the Department of Education by Congress. So far, Biden has offered nothing but stall tactics, requesting in April that Education Secretary Miguel Cardona draw up a memo about his legal authority to cancel student debt via executive order. A power Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Senator Elizabeth Warren, and other high-profile lawmakers have already concluded exists. Let's be clear, this authority has existed for some time. Former President Trump used his authority three times to suspend payments and student loan interest during the pandemic. Our evidence that Biden's request for a memo detailing his legal authority on power that's already been used is unnecessary. And because student debt is racially regressive, black borrowers owe 100% more in student debt than white borrowers four years after graduating. Canceling this debt would drastically narrow a widening racial wealth gap, closing the black-white wealth gap for student loan borrowers by more than 25 percentage points. Almost two-thirds of student debt is held by women who often struggle to pay back loans after being systematically underpaid in the workforce. Broad-scale cancellation would largely benefit our veterans, farmers, teachers, public defenders, and counselors countless other professionals that often need to have costly degrees yet lack adequate pay. And on top of that, perhaps the most obvious thing is that think of how many young people will be excited by this. Democrats, they're going to have a turnout problem come 2022, but is there a better way to excite the youth than by canceling their student debt? People would think, oh, wow, well, if Democrats did this for me, if Joe Biden specifically did this for me, perhaps they could do more if they retain control of both chambers of, Cong of Congress. But I mean, it doesn't seem like this is likely. What Biden proposed, at least like what he ran on when he was still a candidate, was canceling $10,000 maximum of student debt only if it goes through Congress. 
And the fact that Biden requested a memo from the education secretary about whether or not he has the legal authority to cancel student debt. I mean, as the article points out, this is nothing more than stall tactics. So what needs to happen is not these laughable clown proposals, just cancel student debt. First of all, the U.S. government holds most of the student debt. It's not like they even have to like buy this out from private holders. I mean, that's going to be the case for some of it, but this will be very easy for them to just delete it all. Unshackle an entire generation from this burden that the previous generation did not deal with. So, um, you know, it's still possible, but I'm not going to hold my breath. Meanwhile, until there's actually a real solution, we're going to get dumb proposals like the one from Marco Rubio, where if you survive a terror attack, you get your debt at least paused for a year. I mean, how kind, how merciful of these U.S. senators. They definitely care about average people. Folks, I just have to say that our little Marjorie Green is growing up so fast. She's finally becoming a big girl politician. And she issued her very first public apology. This is really heartwarming to see. So initially, what happened was she said that mask mandates are like the Holocaust. She then doubled down, tripled down, and then denied having said what was said on television. And now, after some weeks of soul searching, being introspective, she's coming out with an apology. And she's saying, what I said was actually wrong. Now, the way that she says it was a little bit sus. Nonetheless, she did apologize. Take a look. I'm very much a normal person. And I think it's important for me to always be transparent and, and honest. And I just want to tell you all, I'm, I'm really, really lucky. Uh, I was blessed with, I am blessed with amazing parents. And my dad just passed away in April. But I will say he taught me some great things. And one of the best lessons that my father always taught me was when you make a mistake, you should own it. And I have made a mistake and it's really bothered me for a couple of weeks now. And so I definitely want to own it. This afternoon, I visited the Holocaust Museum. The Holocaust is, there's nothing comparable to it. It's, it's, it happened and, you know, over six million Jewish people were murdered. More than that, there were not just Jewish people, black people, Christians, all kinds of people, children, people that, that the Nazis didn't believe were good enough or perfect enough. And the horrors of the Holocaust are something that some people don't even believe happened and some people deny, but there is no comparison to the Holocaust. And there are words that I have said, remarks that I've made that I know are offensive. And for that, I want to apologize. And I am, I am just fine and very glad to be able to come out here and do that because I believe it's important. I believe that if we're going to lead, we need to be able to lead in a way where if we've messed up, it's very important for us to say we're sorry. Okay. Now, one thing that's incorrect is she says, I'm just a normal person. Mm, no, I get that what she's trying to say is, look, we all make mistakes and I'm no different, but you're not a normal person. Like you're dumber than the average person. So that's just one thing that needed to be corrected. Uh, the question is, okay, if you're apologizing for this, which you should apologize for, are you going to apologize for comparing Democrats to Nazis? Because she also did that as well. So she was asked this question. After your visit to the Holocaust Museum today, earlier during recess, you compared Democrats to the National Socialist Workers' Party. Is that something you still stand by after you reflected on everything that the Nazi party did? This was literally her answer to that. You know, socialism is extremely dangerous. And so is communism. And anytime a government moves into policies where there's more control and there's freedoms taken away, yes, that's a danger for everyone. And, and I think that's something that we should all be wary of. Uh, anytime that you have things like cens censorship with social media, um, you know, anytime where we have 
things being taught where one race is being told it's racist, like critical race theory. Those are problems. These are things that we're seeing in policies coming out of the Democrat Party that I think are dangerous for everyone. And, and that's why I'm against them. And, and I'll, I'll never stop saying I'm very much, very much on track. And I'll never stop saying we have to save America and stop socialism. There's no veteran that signed up to serve in the military. And there's nobody that fought for our country because they wanted America to be a socialist country. They all did it because they wanted America to be a free country. So in other words, since she didn't directly address that head on, um, she does stand by her comment comparing the Democratic Party to Nazis, even if she thinks that mask mandates aren't like the Holocaust. And that reporter says, so you still stand by that analogy. She responded by saying, that's the important thing to remember. Thank you guys so much. We got to head out to vote. So <laughs> she's just like, they're asking a question and she just gives whatever answer she wants to, even if it's unrelated to the question. Uh, but what's interesting about that non-answer is that she finally gave us a little bit of insight into what her definition of socialism is. Not that like we all get to choose our own definitions, but what she believes socialism is. And her definition of socialism is social media censorship and critical race theory. This is what Marjorie Green, a lawmaker, a grown woman, thinks socialism is. <laughs> First of all, something that is unilaterally carried out by private companies, love them or hate them, agree with it or disagree with it, by definition, isn't socialistic. Censorship by Facebook, like Twitter banning Trump, that isn't socialism. It's really not that complicated. It means workers own the means of production. And you could uh, factor in, you know, public ownership of a lot more entities, more, you know, intervention within the economy. Sure, I think that that's all perfectly uh, relatable to socialism. But at the end of the day, it means workers own the means of production. It doesn't mean censorship from Facebook and Twitter, you fucking <laughs> moron. And if she's going to consider censorship as like one of the defining characteristics of socialism, state governments across the country are cracking down on the right of US citizens to engage in BDS. Are you gonna condemn that socialism, Marjorie Greene? Are you going to condemn the laws Republicans are passing around the country, like in Florida, where they are making it easier to legally run over protesters? That obviously is an attempt to stifle freedom of speech. Are you going to condemn that socialism, Marjorie Greene? So, I mean, like, it doesn't matter how much she tries, she still gets everything she says wrong. Like, she takes two steps forward and 18 steps backwards. This person should not be in Congress. This person is not very bright, and that's an understatement. So, I mean, regardless, take it or leave it, she apologized for uh, one aspect of her offensive comment but then she let us know again in a million different ways how stupid she is and it's just like if i'm a republican i'm running far away from this individual i don't want her to represent me but um this this is what the party loves i mean this is the future of the republican party i wouldn't be surprised if marjorie green in the coming years was a prominent contender in a presidential race so it's just this is what the Republican Party is. They've embraced their stupidity, and it's not surprising considering this party has pandered to people just like Marjorie Greene for decades now. I mean, they shouldn't be too surprised that the crazies have taken over their party. If she really wants to do better, she should try to just, like, not say anything because she's going to open her mouth and idiotic things are inevitably going to come out. So just, like, stop saying things. Stop, stop putting yourself out there. And maybe, maybe come back Think harder before you make statements, and you might be a little bit less of an embarrassment to yourself. But she's not going to take my advice. I'm just a crazy socialist, so whatever. So I've got a quick video for you just to share some unexpected good news. Whistleblower reality winner will, in fact, be leaving prison finally. She's leaving a little bit early, and she's not necessarily free yet, but she's being transferred from prison to a halfway house. 
So for more details, we go to Julia Conley of Common Dreams, who explains, press freedom advocates were among those celebrating the release of former National Security Agency contractor Reality Winner on Monday after her attorney announced Winner had been transferred from federal prison to a halfway house. Allison Grinter Allen, Winner's lawyer, said the legal team is continuing to pursue a full pardon from President Joe Biden. Winner's release was not part of a commutation, but was the result of time earned from exemplary behavior while incarcerated, according to Grinter Allen, who added that San Antonio's residential reentry management field office may allow Winner to serve the rest of her time in home confinement. The residential reentry center is in charge right now and will manage her transition, but we are definitely still seeking commutation and pardon, the attorney said in a tweeted statement. The fight continues, and I'll still be taking meetings in Washington to press forward the case for commutation and pardon, but the family will be stepping back to concentrate on reality and her health and healing. Winner, who worked at Fort Gordon in Georgia as a contractor with Pluribus International, was arrested in 2017 after federal law enforcement agents determined she had given a secret document about Russian hackers targeting the U.S. election system to reporters at The Intercept. She was charged under the Espionage Act and took a plea deal which included a five-year prison sentence, which she is scheduled to finish serving on November 23rd of 2021. The Freedom of the Press Foundation said Winner's release from federal prison was long overdue. Yeah, and I totally agree with that sentiment there. I don't have much to add. I just wanted to quickly share the good news with you, but I just want to state, because you can never really overstate this, we have to protect whistleblowers, not just individuals like Reality Winner, but also Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning. And thankfully, Chelsea Manning was pardoned by Obama, but she basically went back to jail because she wouldn't rat on Julian Assange. And even though Julian Assange isn't technically a whistleblower per se, he's a publisher of, uh, of a lot of leaks. And individuals may not like what he publishes, particularly liberals, and it might not necessarily be politically expedient to, you know, advocate for these folks right now. I mean, when I asked my senator a question about Julian Assange at a town hall, I heard like audible gasps because his name was like, to bring it up was as if, you know, I mentioned Voldemort at Hogwarts. It's it's ridiculous. We have to make sure that we are protecting whistleblowers because the information that they release, that they believe the American people should know about, oftentimes is to our benefit, even if the United States government wants to withhold that information from us. And there's a piece in Jacobin that explains how Daniel Ellsberg, what he did, what he released as a whistleblower, he basically is responsible in part for ending the Vietnam War. So it's really important that we look out for whistleblowers and we never stop advocating for them. So that's all I'll say. What Reality Winner did here in releasing this information, it was important. It wasn't necessarily with regard to what the U.S. government did, but it's what they didn't want us to know. She revealed information that says there was an attempt by the Russian government to hack into voting systems. They were not successful, but she believed that this information was important, and she wanted to put that out there. For her to be penalized for this, in my opinion, it. It's absurd. So I'll leave that there. This is fantastic news. We have to continue to look out for and advocate for whistleblowers. And we can never stop the pressure. We have to make sure that these folks are protected from prosecution. And yeah, that's it. That's that's all that you know you can really say about this. This is really good news. It's encouraging to see. And of course, whenever there's good news, I, I feel inclined to share it. This is one of those instances where we get a bit of good news, even though she should have never served time in the first place, but I'll take it. So a couple of weeks ago on the program, we looked at a poll from the uh, Democratic Party primary taking place in Ohio for a special election, and it showed that Nina Turner had a massive lead over everyone else. Her closest opponent, Chantel Brown, was like 35 points behind her. Now, of course, it's not a foregone conclusion, but obviously Nina Turner is doing really well. So, of course, you know what that means. The Democratic Party establishment is going to try to stop her, as I predicted, and they're bringing out the big guns. And by big guns, I mean their special weapon, Hillary Clinton. So Hillary Clinton came out of hiding to endorse Nina Turner's opponent in a pathetic attempt to sink Nina Turner's campaign, tweeting, I'm proud to endorse Chantel Brown for Congress in Ohio's special election. Chantel made history as the first black woman to chair her county Democratic Party, and she'll work to help her state and our country recover from COVID. Join me in supporting her. Now, let me remind you that the last time Hillary Clinton came out of hiding to try to stop a progressive from winning was when Elliot Engel was caught on hot mic at a Black Lives Matter rally saying, 
I wouldn't be here if I wasn't facing a primary challenge. I'm paraphrasing, but that was what he said. It was this PR nightmare, and it looked as if he kind of sunk his own campaign. So Hillary Clinton comes out of hiding to endorse him after he says that. <laughs> what happened? Jamal Bowman won. And if anything, her endorsement of Jamal Bowman's opponent helped Jamal Bowman because what happened? Everyone rallied behind Jamal Bowman, sent him money, and this is no different. We all need to make sure that we show Hillary Clinton that we don't care about her input and uh, we're going to use her endorsement of Chantel Brown, Nina Turner's opponent, to further help Nina Turner by donating to Nina Turner. If you've already donated to Nina Turner, you could purchase merch. You can do whatever, make phone calls for Nina Turner, but show Hillary Clinton that she's irrelevant in modern Democratic Party politics and we don't care what she has to say. And honestly, if I'm Chantel Brown, I would not be happy right now that Hillary Clinton endorsed me because in the past, this has kind of been the kiss of death. Once Hillary Clinton comes out to endorse you, it shows that you're desperate and she's not very popular, even within the Democratic Party. This is the individual who is in part responsible for Donald Trump and multiple Supreme Court seats going to the Republican Party for decades. So, I mean, she doesn't have much goodwill left, but what little she has, she continues to squander by coming out of hiding to only endorse the opponents to progressives when progressives specifically are doing well. It's honestly embarrassing. Like if I were Hillary Clinton, I wouldn't want this to be my legacy. Like I wouldn't want to be seen as this figure in the party that tries to stop grassroots momentum. But here we are. And honestly, like I forgot that Hillary Clinton existed before she came out to endorse Chantel Brown. And it was really nice. But it's funny because it reminded me how the left just doesn't take Hillary Clinton seriously. So I want to share some of the responses. Cristo Avalis writes, if anyone was unsure about their vote, this should 100% put them in the Nina Turner camp. And that's exactly right. Scott Desnoyers writes, thank you for real this time, Hillary. OMG, it is so awesome for this blazing endorsement for the working people to get behind Nina Turner. Basically, I mean, her endorsement of Nina Turner's uh, opponent is an endorsement of Nina Turner for normal people. A uh, kiss of death. Totally agree. It's a D plus 64 district. LOL. Benjamin Dixon writes, we good. David Dole says, LOL. Uh, Nathan Meza donated to Nina Turner doing his part. Thank you for that. Um, Donna Martin says, still petty as fuck, I see. Uh, Gato Fumador says, thanks, Hill Dog. I mean, this is just, it goes on and on. It's hilarious to me. You're a sad, pathetic person to want to do this. Um, you know, for her to come out of the woodwork, it's just to endorse the opponent of a progressive is embarrassing. Andrea says, thank you, Queen, for sinking her candidacy. I mean, the responses here are hilarious and it goes on and on. So, I mean, there you have it. Hillary Clinton might have single handedly sealed the fate of Nina Turner's opponent. It's just Anytime there's somebody who was an ally to Bernie Sanders or has the same politics as Bernie Sanders because she's still bitter, she's coming out to endorse them. And I don't know that Hillary Clinton like did this on her own accord. I'm sure that the Ohio Democratic Party establishment called on her and requested her support. But if you are a politician in 2021, you should stay as far away from Hillary Clinton as possible because how many campaigns has she sank at this point? Like, you'd think that they know by now that Hillary Clinton is a toxic figure that you don't want to be associated with, but nevertheless, here we are, and I welcome Hillary Clinton's support of Nina Turner's opponent. Go donate to Nina Turner. So after Joe Manchin announced that he was in opposition to the For the People Act, you had a lot of progressives finally speak up and condemn him. You had AOC on CNN call out his Koch brother connection. You had Jamal Bowman say that he's the new Mitch McConnell. And now, this week, Democratic Party leadership, they're telling progressives, hold back a little bit. We don't want you being too mean to Joe Manchin. This is very irritating to me. So Politico reporter Sarah Ferris reports Schumer and Pelosi have been urging Democrats not to go after Manchin and company when it comes to voting rights. Schumer told outside groups not to bully Manchin ahead of S1 vote, and Pelosi told steering members not to criticize individual senators. So right off the bat, this irritates me because if you don't name and shame these people, I don't know what else is going to work. I'm not saying that like being very abrasive and argumentative is going to pay off, but I know that being polite, trying to hold hands and sing kumbaya with folks like Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin, that 
hasn't paid off. So this right here, they're basically saying we should coddle Joe Manchin because we don't want you to be too mean. We don't want to scare him away. And this is just really frustrating to me. So for more on this, we go to the scoop from Sarah Ferris, and it reads, Liberals have been unleashing their growing frustration at Senator Joe Manchin over his opposition to their party's signature voting rights package ahead of an expected Senate vote next week. But for now, at least, top Democrats are urging their members to hold their fire. As Manchin remains a holdout on S1, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is telling outside groups not to try to bully Manchin, but to instead focus on the historical and factual arguments related to the legislation, according to sources familiar with his remarks. Oh, I'm sure that's going to resonate when his donors are telling him otherwise. In a private meeting Monday night, Speaker Nancy Pelosi also advised lawmakers not to vilify individual senators on the issue, according to several people who attended. While she did not single out Manchin by name, multiple Democrats said they believed she was referring to Manchin, the only Senate Democrat to publicly denounce his opposition to S-1. The call to back off comes amid fierce criticism of Manchin from progressive groups and fellow Democrats in Congress. They're also upset with the West Virginian for defending the filibuster and insisting on a bipartisan infrastructure bill. Representative Jamal Bowman recently called the West Virginia senator the new Mitch McConnell. Earlier this week, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said she doesn't buy Manchin's calls for bipartisanship on voting matters and speculated that his opposition is more likely tied to his wariness of Democrats' effort to rein in dark money. Manchin remains unmoved by all of this. His resistance to the elections bill came into focus again Tuesday. He skipped a Senate Democratic lunch where a group of Texas lawmakers urged passage of S-1 and warned of the GOP's efforts to restrict voting access. Manchin staff did meet with the group, though a source familiar said the Texas group did not request a meeting with the senator until the day of their visit. Now, also, reportedly, Joe Manchin is peeved, not their words, but mine, that progressives and people around the country think that they know what's better for West Virginia than he knows what's better for West Virginia. Um, except that assumes that Joe Manchin just is making this decision individually after doing research, after reading the bill, but that's not what's happening. He's literally opposing the bill because the Koch brothers and their network, they're lobbying him to do just that. So that's why I find this extremely naive and, and quite frankly stupid if Democrats actually want to get this passed, like Democratic Party leadership, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, because you're not going to win him over by talking to him more politely and coddling him and trying to butter him up. The reason he's opposed to this in the first place is because he's corrupt. And the only way I think that you can actually get him to break is if you call out the specific root cause that's driving his unwillingness to support something that he supported back in 2019. And that is this link with the Coke network, the lobbying that they're doing. He's literally reciting their talking points. They're running this effort to um, basically get politicians to reject the partisanship in dc and what does he say is his reasoning for opposing the for the people act oh it's too partisan no republicans support it right but they didn't support it back in 2019 that didn't stop you from co-sponsoring it back then so i mean the specific issue here is the corruption that is why he's unwilling to support it so i don't think that being nice is going to get him to change his mind when money talks so I, I think that this weakness right here, aside from the corruption of Nancy Pelosi herself and Chuck Schumer himself, that's part of the reason why Democrats are so ineffectual when it comes to governance. Because Republicans, no matter what, it doesn't matter what the political context is, how feasible a policy is, whether or not it will or won't get passed, they just scream at the top of their lungs, belligerently so, and they forcefully advocate for what they want, regardless of how unpopular it may be. And Democrats, they're so afraid, they're walking on eggshells around these conservatives in their party, and as a result, their unwillingness to take a stand, it's going to lead to them losing everything. I mean, if they don't pass the For the People Act, this is going to lead to Democrats losing. I mean, in Republican-controlled states across the country, they are cracking down on voting rights. Specifically, they're undoing the things that drove higher voter turnout in 2020. And if Democrats think that they're going to be able to win future elections easily, if these laws don't get overturned, if they don't pass the For the People Act, they're horribly mistaken. And the For the People Act is not a panacea. Like, it's not going to be the end-all be-all that saves American democracy, but is it a step in the right direction? And will that at least 
undo all of the damage caused around the country driven by the stop the steal hysteria to crack down on voting rights? Yes. So, I mean, if their strategy here of calling Joe Manchin works, okay, great. But this strategy of being weak and spineless has never paid off for Democrats. And I don't think that's going to happen now. So it's really frustrating that they're trying to basically forcefully get Democrats who are fighting for people finally to shut up, to censor themselves. When they condemn Ilhan Omar, they go after progressives all the time. It's just, it's really hypocritical. It's unfair. And it's frustrating. I hope that Democrats like Jamal Bowman, AOC, they don't take advice of leadership and they just do what I think is actually going to work or at least what hasn't really been tried, naming and shaming because that's why Joe Manchin is against the For the People Act. It's because he's corrupt, not because he's taking some principled stance based on research and evidence. He's corrupt. Simply put, he's bought. He's being lobbied and it's working. That's it. Don't pretend as if He's this like honest, good faith actor. How would it be if the United States were viewed by the rest of the world as interfering with the elections directly of other countries and everybody knew it? I feel like somebody should tell Joe Biden about the United States' history of supporting regime change, imperialist wars. <laughs> I mean, obviously, his comment there, it lacked self-awareness to a humiliating extent. Having said that, though, like putting that aside for a moment, I do have to give Joe Biden credit where it's due because he is supporting something that I did not expect him to ever support, given his hawkish and militaristic history. He supports the repeal of a law that basically has been used to legally justify our never-ending wars, and this is not something I anticipated. So as Andrea Germanos of Common Dreams explains... Just ahead of Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer announcing a vote on repealing the Iraq War authorization later this year, the White House this week declared its support for legislation to end the 2002 measure, a development welcomed by Democratic lawmakers and progressive groups that have demanded an end to endless wars. At issue is Representative Barbara Lee's H.R. 256, which would repeal the authorization for use of military force against Iraq resolution of 2002 that passed in the wake of the September 11th attacks. The repeal measure, whose support supporters now include even right-wing groups like Americans for Prosperity, has 134 bipartisan co-sponsors. The House is set to vote on the bill Thursday. In a statement of administrative policy released Monday announcing support for H.R. 256, the Biden administration said the United States has no ongoing military activities that rely solely on the 2002 AUMF as a domestic legal basis and repeal of the 2002 AUMF would likely have minimal impact on current military operations. The statement also declares President Joe Biden's commitment to working with Congress on repealing and replacing other existing authorizations of military force. Lee called it great news that Biden is on board with my legislation to repeal the 2002 AUMF, which Congress will vote on this week. This is a long overdue step toward ending our forever war, she tweeted. I have to say, credit where it's due, he gets all the credit in the world for this if he signs this into law. Honestly, in the event this were to pass Congress, I don't know if it's going to pass the Senate, I assume it's going to pass the House, but if it got through Congress and it arrived on Joe Biden's desk, the question of whether or not he'd sign that to me was up in the air. I don't know if he would veto it. So when Congress actually, for the first time ever, enacted the War Powers Act to stop U.S. complicity with Saudi's genocide in Yemen, Trump vetoed that bill. And since all presidents tend to, you know, continue our forever wars, I kind of expected Joe Biden to do, this, do the same thing and be against this because I wouldn't expect him to want to rein in his legal authority to unilaterally wage war without the consent of Congress. You know, uh, he why would he make it any more difficult for himself to do that, given his history of hawkishness? But he proved me wrong. And that's a damn good thing. I'm happy to be proven wrong here in this regard. Now, it remains to be seen how precisely this is going to impact U.S. imperialism. It's not going to end U.S. imperialism, right? 
But one thing that worries me is the line from Biden's administration where he says that we don't necessarily need this to legally justify our current military activities. So, I mean, I don't I don't necessarily know if this will change anything. Will this not give him the legal justification to do drone wars i don't necessarily know like the extent to which biden is waging drone drone wars that's yet to be seen we have to wait on reports for that we know that obama ramped it up and then ramped them down and then trump took over and ramped them up higher than ever before so i don't know if they're using that to justify drone wars i don't know the extent to which this is going to change our occupation of the Middle East, like right away, like a lot of questions kind of remain unanswered because if he says that we're not really using this currently, what does that, what does that mean? Right. In particular, what does this mean in practice? What is it going to amount to? But having said that though, the fact that he's on board and he's not going to veto this and he supports it, that is really, really great. It is a huge step forward in ending forever wars in the United States. So I'm, I'm very pleased to see this, and it's pleasantly surprising to see him support this, even if overall, you know, he's still a little bit tone deaf when it comes to the history of U.S. imperialism. But this is a step in the right direction, finally, after a very long time, almost two decades. All right, so I'm going to preface this segment by saying I think that to compare individuals like Marjorie Greene to any member of the squad is stupid it's a false equivalence obviously because marjorie green is a deeply deeply unserious conspiracy theorist who has no policy solutions whereas the squad the reason why they're controversial unlike marjorie green is because they're proposing policies that are bold that the donors of a lot of democrats and republicans don't want passed so that's why these folks are different, but they still get compared because they're basically seen by the mainstream media as the far left and the far right of both parties. And that may technically be true from the standpoint of like the U.S. Overton window. But still, I don't necessarily think that Marjorie Greene is that different from the Republican Party collectively. Having said that, though, I, I do want to look at this poll from Morning Consult because they examined controversial remarks from Marjorie Green and Ilhan Omar, I don't think that what she said was controversial. Obviously, I'm biased and in the camp of Ilhan Omar. But still, this poll, even if I don't like the comparison, it was really interesting because it highlights how tribalistic the Republican Party's base is. So the title basically sums it all up. Voters are slightly more likely to see anti-Semitism in Ilhan Omar's latest comments if they know she made them. So here's the quick summary by Eli Yokley. The share of GOP voters who see anti-Semitism in Representative Ilhan Omar's remarks comparing U.S.-Israeli-Afghani actions to those taken by Hamas and the Taliban increases 11 percentage points when the Minneapolis Democrats' name is attached. 11 percentage points. That, folks, is statistically significant. Now, Democratic voters were slightly less responsive than Republicans to the lawmaker's name and party affiliation when it came to controversial tweets from Omar and Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene. 49% of Democrats hold unfavorable views of Greene compared with 57% of Republicans who view Omar unfavorably. So let's just step back, disregard that last portion, and we'll tackle that later. But Democrats, according to this poll, the sample size is just under 2,000, they are more likely to form their opinion based on the substance, not based on who said it. This is really fascinating. So here's the breakdown. Voters were asked whether the following tweets were anti-Semitic or not anti-Semitic, with half of respondents seeing the names and party of the lawmakers who said them and the other half seeing only the statement. So here's the statement from Ilhan Omar. We must have the same level of accountability and justice for all victims of crimes against humanity. We have seen unthinkable atrocities committed by the U.S., Hamas, Israel, Afghanistan, and the Taliban. I don't know how this can be seen as anti-Semitic, but it turns out um, most people who don't know that Ilhan Omar said this tend to agree. So the voters who did not know who said this, 41% said it was not anti-Semitic. That's a plurality. 27% said they don't know. And only 31% said that they think that that statement was anti-Semitic. Now with identification, 35% 
of voters if they knew that Ilhan Omar said it, said that it was anti-Semitic. Now, it's still the case that most voters, that is a plurality, said that it was not anti-Semitic, even though they knew it came from Ilhan Omar. But still, that is uh, very interesting. Now, when you base it on party affiliation, so when it comes to Democrats without identification, 31% said that that comment was anti-Semitic, and 42% said it was not anti-Semitic. But with identification, Democrats were less likely to say that it was anti-Semitic. So, you know, you see a little bit of a change when they realize it's from someone like Ilhan Omar, who's a good faith actor, who Democrats obviously are going to more likely approve of. But now here's where it gets really interesting to me. So when you look at Republicans without identification, 40% say that it's not anti-Semitic, 36% say that it is anti-Semitic. So most Republicans, a plurality, think that it's not anti-Semitic. However, when you would tell people that it's Ilhan Omar, 47% now say that it is indeed anti-Semitic. In other words, when you tell Republicans that Ilhan Omar, someone that they don't like, made this comment, then they think, okay, yeah, that's definitely bad. Okay, now let's look at Marjorie Green. So she made this comment. Vaccinated employees get a vaccination logo, just like the Nazis forced Jewish people to wear a gold star. Obviously anti-Semitic. Now, all voters without identification, they thought that this was anti-Semitic. A majority thought it was anti-Semitic uh, without identification. With identification, they were less likely to say that it was anti-Semitic. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, when you look at Democrats without identification, 64% thought it was anti-Semitic. And more people thought that it was anti-Semitic when they found out it was from Marjorie Greene. So that's a pretty big jump. But let's look at Republicans. So without identification, a majority of Republicans saw Marjorie Greene's comments as anti-Semitic. But with identification, less people thought that it was anti-Semitic. So let's pause for a moment because that's a lot of information. Um, basically, the takeaway, simply put, is that Republicans are more tribalistic. Democrats are still tribalistic, but Republicans are much more tribalistic according to the results of this poll. So they will have an opinion of something, but that opinion will change based on who said it. And this is really fascinating to me because what I want, like the goal is to have people form opinions based on evidence, statistics, data. But what you see here is that Republicans are going to change their opinion on something based on who said it. Like the political identity really influences people's opinions of a particular statement. And this really reminds me of an old segment. I think it was on the Jimmy Kimmel sh show where they asked people like they went around and they said, listen, what do you prefer more? The Affordable Care Act or Obamacare? And a lot of people were just like, yeah, I, I, I like the Affordable Care Act. And they were asking why. Well, it's more equitable. You know, Obama, you know, he made Obamacare and that's bad. Now, obviously, the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare, this is the same thing, but people didn't know it. But because Obama was associated with Obamacare more explicitly, people were less likely to want to support it because they hear Obama bad. So they just like have this visceral response to Obamacare. So that's what this reminds me of. You know, it's like Republicans initially, they say, well, that doesn't seem anti-Semitic. But then, you know, uh, if they know that Ilhan Omar said it, they're more likely to say, yeah, that's definitely anti-Semitic. It's truly fascinating. Now, one last thing I want to look at here. So Republicans more likely to dislike Omar than Democrats are to dislike Green. So overall, electorate holds similar views of both members. Now, this is a little bit uh, depressing to me. So all voters, their uh, opinion of Ilhan Omar is uh, mostly negative. It's net unfavorable. Whereas when it comes to Marjorie Greene, she has a slightly lower favorability, but not as high as an unfavorability as Ilhan Omar. So Ilhan Omar definitely triggers this like negative reaction in a lot of American voters. And I think that a lot of this has to do with her being the only member of Congress who wears a hijab. I think it's Islamophobia. But on top of that, I do think it's also perceived extremism that is shoved down the throats of Americans by mainstream media. Uh, but independence so they tend to uh, like Marjorie Greene more than Ilhan Omar, according to this poll. And I won't lie, that kills my soul. It kind of makes me lose faith in humanity. Um, but it just goes to show you how brainwashed people are. Again, Ilhan Omar and Marjorie Greene, to even like speak, at that, speak about them in the same sentence, it's, it's absurd because there's no comparison. These individuals 
are incredibly dissimilar. One is a serious lawmaker, another is a clown. But having said that, though, perception is reality. And when you are brainwashed, when you hear constantly how extreme these individuals are, even if you don't necessarily watch Fox News, if you're not high off the Fox News Kool-Aid, I mean, still, you're going to hear about the extremism of Ilhan Omar. And so, you know, you might not hear it directly, but you might hear it secondhand. You know, someone who does watch Fox News might say, oh, I don't like the squad there. They're super extreme. So, I mean, that that stuff works. So, um, yeah, very interesting, uh, to say the least. And here's why. Because we live in an abundant society. We live in a place where you could have literally weed delivered to your front door. It's like, what? And somehow, oh, that's liberty. No, that's actually slavery. That was Turning Point USA founder Charlie Kirk comparing weed delivery services to slavery. If you did a double take, you weren't alone. Because even for Charlie Kirk, like that's that's a bit extreme, right? I mean, I know that he's out there he has some really cringe beliefs he was a big stop the steal guy but even for him that's that's a bit crazy so i actually had to check to make sure that he wasn't taken out of context or he wasn't being facetious but no he actually said that with a straight face because he meant it although he did realize how silly he sounded. So as salon writer Zachary Petrizzo explains, Turning Point USA founder Charlie Kirk, who is currently fighting off an FAC complaint over his group's refusal to disclose its donors, made the remarks on Friday while speaking at TPUSA's annual Young Women's Leadership Summit in Dallas, Texas. We live in a place where you can have literally weed delivered to your front door. It's like, what? And somehow, oh, that's liberty, Kirk said according to video of the speech posted online. The pro-Trump pundit then added, no, that's actually slavery so stupid upon the completion of his initial riff kirk began to backtrack on his statement that's actually um uh, okay that's actually a form of slavery for media matters watching kirk stated that's a form it's a form of being it's a form of being subservient to something that actually controls you that's not you being free a tpusa spokesperson didn't immediately return a salon request for comment on kirk's remarks Mm, even though he did a little bit of backtracking and damage control, it's still deeply, deeply stupid. Having weed delivered to your doorstep, not only is that extremely based, that is quite literally liberty. To ban that would not be like the promotion of freedom. That's like backwards mental gymnastic logic that you're using to like justify banning something because you don't like it. Oh, well, it controls you. It controls your mind. So like... I don't like it, ban it. I mean, you could literally apply that logic to everything. Pornography, which he probably wants to ban as well. Uh, you know, not just weed, but alcohol. It's obviously a fact that you are more free if you are able to engage in things like smoking pot, watching pornography. That's up to you as an individual. And to take that away means you are against liberty. But in his weird mind, no, no, no. See, it's bad. I don't like it. So if we take that away from people, we're actually giving them more freedom because they're not controlled by the substance. See? Smart. I mean, it doesn't matter. Like, whatever they say, they're always going to frame it in a certain way, no matter how clownish it appears. So they literally will be against legalizing recreational pot use for adults. And then they'll frame that as, oh, no, no, we're in favor of liberty because it controls you. Dude, fuck off. That's not how liberty works, dummy. That's not the way that liberty works. The standard is if somebody is an adult and they know the dangers of something, which, I mean, weed is not dangerous, but something like alcohol, for example, and cigarettes, if they know the dangers, they should be allowed to do that. Consenting adults should be allowed to do what they want between one another so long as they're not hurting anyone else, not hurting society. But these folks who claims to be about freedom and liberty, like the opposite is actually true. And it's not just the issue of legalization of uh, recreational pot. It's also abortion. Well, we support freedom and liberty, but we also want to ban abortion. We literally want to tell women what they can and can't do with their own body. Like imagine if it was a crime to jerk off because all of those dead babies that you just skeeted into a sock, that's like genocide. Like imagine if they applied that logic to themselves. It'd be stupid and twisted, right? They also want to make sure that trans people can't use the bathroom of their choice. They can't play in school sports if they're young. They want to make sure that gay people can't be married. I mean, I don't know what his stance on LGBTQ plus marriage is, but 
I'd imagine that he was a little culture warrior. So, you know, it frustrates me that they really want to have it both ways. They really want you to think that they support freedom and liberty while they fight to take away civil rights, civil liberties. I don't know if he supports the Patriot Act and whatnot. Um, I, I can't think of a better liberty than actually living, but I bet he supports wars. It's just, it's so frustrating. Like, this is orwellian this is george orwell's america like this is what he wrote about it was about war being peace freedom is slavery and ironically they cite george orwell to argue that it's actually leftists who are orwellian it's just everything is upside down and it's because of folks like him who literally are arguing that it's slavery it's not free to get weed delivered to your door you're a clown charlie kirk and nobody should take you seriously, but millions of people who do take you seriously, um, I hope that someday they come to their senses because that logic right there, that's dumb. That's not smart. So I want to pick up where we left off last week. We were having this conversation about corporate rainbow washing of LGBTQ plus pride. And I discussed how irritating it was to me that all of these large multi-billion dollar corporations are changing their logos to rainbows in order to celebrate pride as they literally donate to anti-LGBTQ plus politicians. Like it's, it's absolutely infuriating it's hypocritical and I hate it, right? But there is honestly a difference between some companies and others. Like McDonald's, for example, when they change their logo to a rainbow flag, that's offensive to me, but it's less offensive than companies like Boeing changing their logos to, you know, the rainbow flag or Raytheon because you're literally manufacturing bombs that were murdering children with in the Middle East and North Africa. So like sit this one out when we're talking about civil rights, just stay silent because we don't want your support. We reject your support. Again, don't speak for every single LGBTQ plus person, but I think that obviously a murderous company, like I don't want your endorsement. I reject your endorsement. I think that most people would agree with that sentiment, but like that, in my opinion, Raytheon, Boeing, human rights abusers are the ones that are the most egregious who really should shut the fuck up about pride. And we have a new uh, contender in the, uh, realm of rainbow washing that spoke up and this one was just it was beyond the pale for me so ice yes that ice that torments immigrants tweeted out during pride month we recognize our lgbtq plus employees reflect on the trials that their community has endured and rejoice with them in the triumphs of those who have bravely fought and continue to fight for full equality okay so the first thing you're going to notice is uh that ratio Oof, that's a big ratio. But ICE is uh, is tweeting this out. The American Gestapo is tweeting this out. I mean, I don't even know where to begin. But thankfully, I didn't have to formulate a response because, I mean, my, my reaction was just to feel disgusted at this. But the left, they absolutely did not hesitate. They pounced and they dragged ICE for this because if anyone is going to talk about human rights and pride the last should be ice this person says simply get fucked you pieces of shit totally agree uh this shoe and they point to an article from rolling stone uh that reads a trans woman died in ice custody then ice deleted video footage of her yeah matt just shares uh this meme which <laughs> is great um I hope all those employees find new jobs and your org gets abolished. Everyone, including the social media person working for y'all, should be ashamed. This person says, you're going to release all those LGBTQ plus migrants and refugees you got caged up and trying to deport? If not, shut the fuck up. Get fucked losers. This person shared a maple cocaine tweet. Conservatives, let's round up Muslims and put them in camps. Liberals, hire more women guards. And this is basically like what we're seeing here, like the rainbow washing of one of the most egregious organizations in American government. Uh, shut the fuck up. Fuck off. Our expectations for you were low, but holy fuck. And it goes on and on. Basically, like every single reply was dragging them. And it was so satisfying to see as a member of the LGBTQ plus community. ICE is a despicable, morally reprehensible organization that has done so much damage to human beings. Tormented is still tormenting communities. And to even have a Twitter account, like to tweet anything I mean, you think that they'd want to hide their faces, but they have really the audacity 
during Pride to use the rainbow logo to pretend as if they're allies and they support human rights. You don't support human rights. You are fascists. Anyone who works at this organization should be ashamed of themselves and this organization should not exist. I don't think much else has to be said. Um, ICE, I mean, when, when they're tweeting about Pride, um, the rainbow washing has gone too far. Please do not ever say anything about Pride human rights, civil rights, civil liberties even, if you A, are fascistic and you abuse human rights and torment communities, or B, manufacture things that we use to kill people. Well, folks, that is everything. Thank you all so much for tuning in if you've made it this far. Um, as usual, we're not going to leave before we thank all of the folks who make the show possible, all of our supporters across multiple platforms, Patreon, PayPal, uh, YouTube, uh, Twitch. I I'm, like, there's too many now. I'm forgetting them. But thank you all so much. I truly appreciate it. Uh, that's all. If you want more human support, you can see me on Thursdays at 7 p.m. PST on Twitch. And, um, yeah, Dystopian Times is coming next week. Is that already? Yeah, that's next week. Wow. Um, I should probably, like, get to work on that. So <laughs> I'll see you all later. Take care, everyone. My name is Mike Fioreto. This has been The Humanist Report. Bye.